Hello, my name is uh, Warner Green. It's a pleasure to welcome you to World AIDS Day at 40 years here at Gladstone. Uh, we will, uh, I will make an introduction of our uh, speaker today, Dr. Robert Gallo, uh, as the, and then he will present. And if you have questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat. And then at the end of his uh, presentation, we will get to as many questions uh, as possible. But let me begin by introducing uh, Dr. Gallo, who is the Homer and Martha Godelsky Distinguished Professor in Medicine. Uh, he directs the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland. Um, I first met Bob when I was a young investigator at the National Cancer Institute at the NIH. We had just molecularly cloned the alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor, what many people know as CD25, and had discovered it was overexpressed on HTLV-1 infected adult T-cell leukemia cells. So since Bob and his colleagues had discovered HTLV-1 and had isolated and characterized IL-2 as an incredibly important T-cell growth factor, I called and asked whether he might meet with me to discuss this leukemia and whether expanded expression of growth factor receptors might play a role in its development. Well, despite being incredibly busy, an internationally acclaimed scientist with probably over 100 people working in his lab, Bob agreed, strangely, to meet with me. And that meeting started what I regard as an incredibly important lifelong mentor-mentee relationship. Our interactions ranged from doing battle over on opposite sides of the tennis court at a club near NIH to Bob serving for many years as the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology that I was fortunate to uh, found and direct for 27 years. For his mentorship and friendship, I will always be most grateful. But enough personal reflection, let me introduce you more formally to Dr. Gallo. Medical school at Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, medical training at the University of Chicago, 30 years at the National Cancer Institute. And then in 1996, he co-founded the Institute of Human Virology at the University of, uh, of Maryland School of Medicine. And in 2011, became the, the co-founder and international scientific advisor to the Global Virus Network. What about his scientific contributions? In 1976, his laboratory discovered T-cell growth factor, now known as IL-2. In 1980, using IL-2, he discovered the first human retrovirus, HTLV-1, and with his Japanese colleagues, linked it to the cause of the adult T-cell leukemia in its most acute form, an aggressive and rapidly progressive leukemia with a life expectancy of six months. In 1981, he discovered the second known human retrovirus, HTLV-2. And then in 1983 and 1984, he and his colleagues co-discovered HIV, the third known human retrovirus, and importantly provided the definitive proof that this virus was the cause of AIDS. Uh, he then went on to develop a life-saving HIV blood, uh, blood test. And in 1986, he and his colleagues described uh, the first new human herpes virus in more than 25 years, HHV6, which is the cause of, of rose infant, an infant illness called roseola. In 1995, his colleagues, he and his colleagues discovered the first natural endogenous inhibitors of HIV, namely the beta chemokines, which propelled uh, later discovery of CCR5 as the co-receptor for HIV. Now for his work, Dr. Gallo has received uh, many scientific awards and I will only present a highly abridged list today. He has been honored with 35 honorary doctorate degrees from multiple universities in multiple countries. He's a member of the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and members of the Royal Scientific Societies of Scotland, Belgium, and Ireland. He won the Lasker Award twice, first for the discovery of HTLV-1 in 82, and then the co-discovery of HIV in 1986. He won the General Motors Charles S. Mott Cancer Research Prize, he won the Gardner Award from Canada, the Japan Prize, the Paul Ehrlich and Ludwig Darmsteiner Prize from Germany, the World Health Award presented by President Gorbachev in Vienna, the, pre, the preeminent international Dan David Prize, for, uh, the top prize in Israel. And I could continue with this list of prizes, but won't. He was the most cited scientist in the world between 1980 and 1990. He has published close to 1300 uh, papers. As you can see, Bob's science has had huge impact throughout the world, and he has not rested. He continues doing vibrant, impactful work at IHV and within the Global Virus Network. I can think of no one more appropriate to speak to us on World AIDS Day, now 40 years after the recognition of the first patients with AIDS, 
that occurred in the summer of 1981 than my friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Gallo. Bob, the stage is yours. I don't know what to say after that, but I want people to put it in this perspective. Uh, I have very similar feelings about Warner, so that's, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and we'll hear a little of that as I go through my talk. But I, I, to put in perspective, Warner mentioned about tennis. Well, I, I was lucky if the game ended, um, well, I was lucky if it ended six for Warner and zero for me. It was something like that. So he was so dominant on the tennis court that that gives you an idea of his exaggeration uh, in my behalf. I would like to begin by really reversing um, tribute. I, I want to start by thanking you especially for this invitation of all possible kinds of invitations, because I have many fond memories of a decade of impressive Gladstone visits, even more actually, I think. And I am very proud to be speaking in San Francisco on World AIDS Day. Below are, please, there are many other people that could be listed here, but understand that it's everything I'm doing on this talk, as I've been asked, is from a personal perspective. So you don't agree with me, um, don't get angry because I was asked to give my perspective. So, but this is what comes to my mind immediately scientifically. But before I say that, there's the non-scientific contributions of San Francisco, which are very great. The concept of activism in the gay community was early on, I didn't understand it, even have some disturbance by it, but it came quickly to realize that this was important, needed, and was a, a real stimulant to medical research and a help for our funding. No one represented that, that more to me than the late Martin Delaney, who I regarded as a personal friend with his staff and colleagues. And I think no one did more and has been more underestimated as time goes by. And of all places, it deserves to be highlighted in this, my first words. But I remember Merle Sand, his early and original major African program contributions. This really was a beginning highlight of people paying attention to the African problem and the African people. Paul Bolverding, who I think is the most significant clinical investigator in the world in HIV AIDS. Bob Grant, who I first heard at Gladstone in developing the PrEP program. Warner Green, who I regard as the most significant career-long molecular biologist, not just of HIV, but of human retroviruses. And Jay Levy, a pioneer of early virology of HIV, and prompted us to look for extracellular HIV inhibitory factors. More recent years, Steve Deeks for his therapeutic insights many times over. I want to say again that sometimes you get warned, don't mention a lot of people because you always leave people out. That is true, but these are things that immediately come to my mind. This is an outline of what I'd like to say. It's a lot to cover. So if I go faster than you'd like, I'm sorry, but I, I wanna try to do it. I wanna say a bit about pandemics, it won't be long. And then into the thoughts and technology that gave us HIV, the early work that Warner's already adequately mentioned virtually, and the difficulties and ultimately achievement of some goals. A selection of some other key early advances from my perspective, the beginning of therapy, some of it a historical first, therapy reaching its maturity, today's therapy and future goals, and prevention by vaccine or drug status and a criticism of some of the policies. As I think everyone here in this, listening to this would know, there have been about six great pandemics in the past hundred years and one close to the 1900s that I don't include. But if you look carefully at the slide, the first, the, or not the first, but three of them are all due to the same kind of virus, influenza. The, influ the great flu of 1918, 1919, which sometimes is the only one that I list as a pandemic to illustrate of an influenza virus, known as the Spanish flu, the great flu, et cetera. An H1N1, the Russian flu of 77, 1977, H1N1, the swine flu, or H1N1, and then almost a pandemic, but not reaching the Americas, H5N1, the avian flu of 2008. If you put those together and say one virus type, uh, we then have polio of the 50s, HIV of the late 70s, and likely before, SARS, coronavirus 2, as you know, of 1919, both these latter two, of course, are still progressing. 
I think there's some things common about pandemics, at least from my perspective, and I, I want to say deal with them with you. Um, they occur about not as generally as quickly as people are saying today, but about 25 to 30 years apart, about a generation and a half, except for influenza, which keeps coming back and some years is worse than other years. And then occasionally it breaks through to become an entire pandemic. But if you look at various virus types, it is about once every generation and a half, we might get a new surprise by a new kind of virus, not just flu. And in between the pandemics, and most, you'll have most epidemics of, or, of contemporary times will include dengue, SARS, MERS, influenza, strains, chikungunya, West Nile, Ebola, Zika. They're all caused by RNA viruses, these single-stranded viruses of high replication, easy to find. I don't really consider them discovery when they're found because they're dripping off the tongue usually. And they have high mutability. And except for one, they're easily transmissible. And you know which that one is, HIV. That presents a very different story. And slowly, I will move in that direction. But I believe the most common feature of any pandemic can be described in one word, change. What changes? Before we look at the slide and think of SARS coronavirus 2, let's think about ancient times we, we know we, where we have recorded history. We know when Romans reached the Eastern Mediterranean, there were new epidemics in both worlds, far to the East and then coming back towards Europe and North Africa. When, when Columbus sailed to the new world and many Europeans followed, there were new epidemics in the Americas and at least one or two things were brought back to Europe. We won't go into those details. On a more minor scale, in a more recent scale, we can even think of non-viruses like Lyme disease as farming increases, deforestation occurs. And in my area, the deers are right in our backyard every night. Uh, and then you have Lyme disease. We have air conditioning and refrigeration. Uh, we get Legionnaire's disease. We can go on many in many ways like this, but there are also changes in viruses, not just social changes. Probably people who study it believe polio came about uh, from a mutation of an enterovirus, the Coxsackie virus that became neurotropic from being, you know, infecting cells of the GI tract as its predominant mode. It gained neurotropism. So we do have that too. And we can uh, really then think, what about the great influenza? What happened there? Likely there's constant, the, the constant shift of genetic changes in flu lead to most of the real changes. But in addition, people argue in a social change and that social, social change is World War I, the barracks in the United States, in Kansas, it's believed was the, one of the first real outbreaks. What about HIV? Well, I think HIV, we all know, came from chimp to man, gorilla to man, probably occurred many times, maybe still occurring, according to some. Uh, but there had to be also, a, or was likely, and evidence is for a genetic change occurring that allowed it to become more transmissible man to man. But there's also important social changes that occurred post-World War II that allowed this thing to spread very far and wide. And those things, that happened pretty fast. How could a difficult to transmit virus move so fast? Well, the, well we, we have only social history. These are the best guesses. The rapid disappearance of the colonial powers from Africa and people not learning enough the new ways and forgetting maybe the old ways forced some populations to rapidly migrate to cities with an increase in prostitution. This is followed by its global movement. We can say that after World War II, we had development of air travel, tourism, on a pretty large scale, increasing. Drug abuse, the in intravenous drug abuse, becoming an international crazy phenomenon. Blood moving from nation to nation. For example, Japanese don't use their own blood, but rely on Europe and American blood for their blood transfusions. Uh, these things, and coupled with increased sexual activities, led to the rapid movement of the virus that should have been hard to rapidly move. I often hear commentators today say, we'll never forget. I don't know how many times I heard Governor Cuomo say that at night. I used to agree with a lot of his statements of policies. I used to think he was one of the most uh, informative despite um, his recent problems. I thought he was smart. But he also used to say this, we will never forget. I say we will. This is from lessons of prior virus pandemics. Roughly a generation and a half later, we forgot in each case. The story of HIV is particularly relevant. 
For example, I've heard medical scientists, public health people listing significant pandemics without mentioning HIV. Once I was in the audience and the person knew it and, and then apologized to me, like, oh yeah, there are some people working on that disease that's gone now. This is uh, strange, but it's really true. We do forget. Um, I'd like to move now towards HIV discovery as a cause of AIDS. Uh, those of you at Gladstone have seen this slide before, in some of these slides, but there will be several that you've seen before. I mean, not a high percent, but a significant percent. I came to the National Cancer Institute in the middle of the 1960s. Like Warner said, we met there. And uh, for whatever the good things he said, he was also an enormously productive young scientist who contributed the HTLV1 in very fundamental ways, catalyzing further developments in the field. But in the 1960s, before you concentrate on the slide, hear me that we, I, I, can, I can testify, there was a serious respect for infectious diseases, epidemics, global problems, et cetera. By the mid 1970s, I used to hear, oh, that's a problem for tropical disease institutes only. It's a problem for those people, not for us a political, you, politically incorrect statement you could never make today, even if you believe that, and of course it's not true. If you want evidence for that, the departments of microbiology were in fact abandoned in some famous important American medical schools. And I used to hear this phrase all the time, it's over in the industrial world, therefore, therefore we can forget about it, now turning to these statements on the slide. You know, leave the problem for those specialists in tropical disease institutes and let's focus on chronic degenerative diseases only. Make the money go that direction. Ironically, some chronic degenerative diseases that they were speaking about may have virus involvement and do have virus involvement proven in some of the cases they were talking about. There was a strong view that retroviruses do not infect humans and there were many reasons for believing this and I'll come to them in a second. And the third was that no virus causes cancer or plays any role in cancer at any stage in man. This is a conclusion of the 1974 Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories Conference on the Origins of Human Cancer organized by Jim Watson and John Cairns. So the early 1980s though, the biases were overcome. Viruses were shown to be the cause or involved in a stage of the origin of about 20% of human cancers. You know, retroviruses were found in humans, shown to cause some leukemias, also same virus. You know, I don't want to digress too much. I'll become too late. But when I was uh, young, they used to say, you know, one gene, one protein, one agent, like one virus, one disease, one, you know, one gene, one protein, one protein, only one function. None of it's true, as you know. Here's the HTLV1, for example, can cause a very vicious leukemia. That's its most common. But in some parts of the world, for example, in the Amazon, it causes more likely the paralytic neurological disease, which occurs everywhere with HDLV1, but more there. Modest immune abnormalities everywhere in a, in a subtype of HDLV1 type C is causing a real epidemic of bronchiectasis and fatal pulmonary disease in the Aboriginal Australians. So those viruses were, you already heard, they were found in the early 80s. What a coincidence. It was like strange. It was like handed to us on a silver platter. I mean, honestly, what a, coincidence, what a coincidence. Sometimes I stop and think it's almost, it's almost shocking. HTLV1 1980, HTLV2 1982, what's coming on us? A new epidemic. One of the great pandemics of history appears. What's it do to another retrovirus? So how do I think these developments occurred? Now, they are from where I sit. And I'm remembered by the father of a French friend of mine, a businessman who used to say to me, Bob, you know, it depends where you sit what colors of the rainbow you see. So I, I try to keep that in mind. But I had a fairly good view of human retrovirology from the early days. So I think uh, I may be entitled to make some impressions on this regard. First, why were the views strong against the possible existence of human retroviruses? It was really a terrible time. I want to tell you, you know, this, before you look at the reasons that I list, um, there are a lot of things. I remember coming into meetings with evidence, really with evidence and being said that we used to call the viruses RNA tumor viruses at that time, not retroviruses. And I remember uh, one of my colleagues saying, well, here comes Bob with his RNA rumor virus. It was really strong resistance. I have a slide that I've shown many times. 
but I didn't put it into this talk. I may have shown it to you before. It was the letter from Robert Wagner of Journal of Virology, a rather strong letter. Uh, it was the com rather complete story at the time of HTLV1, which we then parceled into smaller papers, and thank God for PNAS, um, were published. But that was outwardly rejected with hostile notions that please stop talking about this nonsense, right in writing. It's in a frame on my wall, my office, because nobody believes it and it's ridiculous, okay? That's the truth to the young people. So the reasons for the strong views were decades of searching, a few decades of searching with negative results and some false starts. And there was high replication in known animal models. Therefore, it would have been easy to find, so, they, so people thought. I wondered though, is that really true? We select the animal models that we use, don't we? We wouldn't select ones that were very hard to find the virus, would we? We would select it where it was obvious and where you could work with it, wouldn't we? There was little evidence in primates at the time for disease causing agents until the late 1970s. Shown by a, a group in um, Los Angeles, human sera in the presence of human complement lysed, tested animal retroviruses, therefore humans were protected. But they only tested as few and they were small animals retroviruses, and they didn't test primate or human, which are not lysed by human serum with complement. Human research was less appreciated at the bottom of the slide. Cancer as catching was thought to be a primitive concept. They forgot there were slow viruses. People didn't mean that people with cancer were infectious, rather that somewhere along the lifeline they got exposed in a difficult way to a virus that could be detrimental or play a role in the stage of cancer development. We get closed minds, especially when funding is elsewhere. There was also, and not listed on the side, resentment against the NCI's virus cancer program, which died during this period, ironically, didn't see the, the developments that occurred in positive light that were soon to come in the early 80s, where pap the papillomavirus demonstrated to be causative of, of some human cancers, important human cancers, the hepatitis viruses came through. EBV started to become believed, HTLV1, uh, probably the only one that does the whole thing from being soup to nuts, it can do it all. It doesn't need seemingly any cofactors or anything else. And a very oncogenic agent with 4% leukemia occurrence. And in some places, substantially higher. And as Graham Taylor in Ohio says, if, you're, if you get it from your mother, there's a 20% chance you get leukemia. I don't know in many carcinogens worse than that. And there was still another reason that there was prejudice against this idea. And that was a publications from a very top molecular biology group in New York, in which they thought they could detect by biochemistry via RNA and reverse transcriptase. We were able to show that this was DNA polymerase gamma, the mitochondrial DNA polymerase, and the fragments they were detecting were membrane material from mitochondria. Um, and, but all those things really hurt the field. Things looked better when the advances that kept us looking, shown in orange, were Howard Temin's provirus theory started to become verified. Things started to make more sense about animal retroviruses and reverse transcriptase was discovered in 1970, Temin in Baltimore, providing an outline of the first stage of infection. And then the outline of retrovirus genetics coming from Peter Vogt from when he was in Seattle, and uh, Hannah Fusa when he was the late Hannah Fusa, who was at Rockefeller at the time, are two of the most important contributors. Making reverse transcriptase assay sensitive and distinct from human cellular DNA polymerases alpha, beta, and gamma for use as a surrogate marker took about 40%, maybe 50% of my time in the 1970s. David Baltimore in our group made contributions to this can't go into this detail now. But two things also drove us to T cells, the capacity to grow human T cells by using interleukin-2. We had a kind of a, uh, a two-pronged uh, way of approaching human retroviruses. We wanted to be able to grow human target cells, what we thought were, would be target cells, in relatively pure form and in significant amounts. Growth factors were just discovered. You, you'll remember Stanley Cohen, Rita levy Montalcini, uh, EGF, and nerve growth factor respectively, that was just happening. You know, we, and T cells were just becoming known in this period of time. So it's not like, don't think like it was like now. The concept of cytokines was not there. 
when we found interleukin-2, this became a paradigm for a pa paradigm for cytokine approach. It was not thought, for example, we found that we found that activated T cells with PHA could make colony stimulating factor, but colony stimulating factor worked on myeloid or granulocytic cell differentiation. This was thought to be crazy. Why would one cell be regulating another cell? Leo Sachs, who discovered CSF, told, told me that when he visited NIH. This was 1971. And we, we published that before uh, two weeks. I said, I don't know why, but that's what we find. We returned to PHA stimulated lymphocytes when we found interleukin-2 because I was desperate to find growth factors and I was looking in conditioned media from anything. And when I say I, I mean our group. Um, and and uh, I will try to mention some key players. Our isolation of a new strain of given ape leukemia virus associated with T cell leukemia in 1978 after Kawakamiya found a myeloid leukemia associated given ape leukemia virus. But we found ours in the wild, actually causing leukemia in given apes in the wild. This was 1978. These things, interleukin-2 of 1976 and the given ape leukemia virus in 1978 turned attention of our group more towards T cell malignancies. Our approach then was to develop methods to grow primary blood cells using growth factors, coupled with finding ultra-sensitive but specific assays for finding a retrovirus. Reverse transcriptase, as you know, provided major advances in molecular biology by providing a mechanism for the provirus theory of Temin and became a powerful tool that impacted molecular biology in several ways. But for us, it might also become a surrogate marker for a retrovirus. It did. It's a thousand times more sensitive than electron microscopy. It allows for frequent sampling of cultures for testing of a new virus. You can't do this by electron microscopy. You can't every 15 minutes take electron micrograms. In fact, I never saw an, an, an electron microscope. To this day, I haven't seen one. Especially important for viruses that are released in periodic bursts. And these viruses are released in periodic bursts. So that was lucky. Ultimately, we, we, we repeatedly isolated from blood and from lesions of the skin, the novel retrovirus called HDLD1. You've seen this picture before. It's shown, the virus is shown budding from a cell membrane. It used to be a requisite. If, if you were ever gonna claim a retrovirus, you had to show this. That requirement was never made again. It was sure made for us at that time. Leukemic lymphoblasts are shown at the bottom. And you've seen the next slide before too at Gladstone. And that's the first patient from which a retrovirus was isolated. He was only 28 years old. He died a vicious death, fast, fast, fast disease. He was dead in about six months. There can be a smoldering form of this disease as well, described by Takatsuki in Japan in chronic form as well. And then these lesions that you see in the skin are quite common. They're infiltrates of leukemic cells into the skin. Warner Green's uh, partner at that time is, was Tom Waldman. And Tom Waldman would, was able to bring patients in and NCI to study. And uh, as I remember, he was able to get some of these patients in for study. After the, this was done, after it was finally accepted and published in PNAS, we were able to move swiftly in the field. And these were probably the most peaceful and happiest times of my career, 1981, 1982, 1983. Of course, then AIDS came along. You can never have peace when AIDS is there for many reasons, some political, some just the nature of, of the beast, the nature of the work, the nature of the pressure that any observation you have, there's pressure on your plate to move a little further. I can honestly say we never had what my colleague at the time and friend Bill Hazelton used to say that every time they had a, a significant advance or discovery, he, they had a champagne party and he had a lot of champagne bottles. Honestly, uh, we never had any because there was always the doubts, always worry, always what isn't done. But conceptually, the AIDS features were similar to what we knew about HDLVs. Uh, listen to the way we were sitting and you'll see that this is no ingenious thought to think about AIDS as being caused by a human retrovirus. We listened to clinicians tell us, they made the first observation, like I think the first scientific observation, namely the CD4 T cells decline. Thus, we were thinking that if this is a virus, it might be tropic for CD4 T cells. What does that make you think of? The mode of transmission. We heard from the epidemiologists, especially Jim Curran, that this seemed to be blood danger, body fluid danger, and mother to infant danger. Uh, well, what did that make you think of? 
These were things we knew about HDLV1. CD4 T cells targets, mode of transmission, blood, sex, mother, and infant. Then there was the long latency to disease that surely suggested a slow virus if it is a virus, obvious from the histories and following patients. The immune impairment. Well, HDLV1 was shown to impair the immunity right from the onset. Minor, modest, compared to HIV, definitely minor or modest, but very definitely occurs. We knew it was prevalent in Haiti, HIV, and eventually we learned Africa. Well, HTLV is it very prevalent in Haiti and certainly in equatorial Africa, parts of it. Technically, the methods for growth and culture of T cells were based on IL-2 and based on sensitive assays for reverse transcriptase. So we can move towards ideas now. And there were a number of ideas for the cause of AIDS. They began in 1982. These were notable theories. Two of them that were not infectious. Amyl nitrate for sexual stimulation by FDA lasted many years. Then they changed it and said, well, they really meant cofactor. And that lasted for a while too. But really, I don't think it's either. And there was many, we don't have to sit and discuss why this was not a great theory. Similarly, at NIH, there was autoimmunity to autologous leukocytes. This was said to be due to rough sex, that you get leukocytes from someone else that entered your blood, you react to those leukocytes, and you start cross-reacting with your own cells. But this too wasn't a very good idea. And although you would be amazed at the number of high-level immunologists that were extremely drawn to this at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting in 1983, and the, 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 I mean, we just stop and think, rough sex has been around for a while. It wasn't invented in the 1970s. And uh, I don't know what else to say, but mother to child transmission uh, certainly doesn't fit. Um, I, blood transfusions, well, you could say it fits because they, they get some foreign leukocytes. Uh, and so those foreign leukocytes might stimulate antibodies to the autologous leukocytes. Yeah, but blood transfusions were going on long before the the pandemic of HIV. So that too didn't make sense. Then there was reasonable ideas that began also at the same time period. I think the best one was the specific adenovirus from Albert Einstein group, because there was a group of gay men in the neighborhood of the of Albert Einstein Medical Center. Uh, and, and, they, and they were getting a specific uh, variant of adenovirus. So that, that was a logical, a very logical one. But it, very soon they saw that they weren't finding it elsewhere. A specific variant of EBV and CMV made some sense because you could find all these things in people that had AIDS. A mycoplasma by the Armed Force Institute of Pathology, and then later as a cofactor, not just by the Armed Force Institute of Pathology, but by the group in Paris and others. A new fungus, this is not well known. NIID had a paper in press in the New England Journal of Medicine. The abstract was in fact published. And, it was, and that was in press at a time our papers were in press. Uh, with our four papers in science we had coming out on the same issue and one in Lancet on May 4, I believe, of 84. But that new fungus was about to come out and then they realized that it was a contaminant and were able to withdraw the paper. So the ideas to us were handed us in, in our lap. And I think the same was true. Max Essex and I were talking on the phone a lot and certainly I have to give credit for that, those discussions as really furthering confidence that this is worthwhile that we look. It's being, it's, we know we, we might be able to play a role here. The bottom says ridiculous. That there is no cause of, of AIDS. There really is no AIDS or, or there is AIDS, but there's no HIV or there is AIDS and there is HIV, but HIV is a passenger virus. Or that was, it was deliberately created by mixing viruses together, so to speak, by the United States, of course. I mean, we, that was a hard period because it was said that people were trying to actively get rid of gay people or Africans. I mean, uh, you know, the sting was a little bit severe because, you know, they tended to be focused towards the U.S. and where are we working, but NIH, a U.S. government place. Finding the virus, though, was one thing. There were the, the, the virus isolate from one patient with lymphadenopathy reported by the French group. And I want to say openly, I think it's okay now to say, I reviewed that paper it was rejected by nature, and I got it into science by calling science and talking to them. I shouldn't say I got it in, but I talked and said it was important. And we got it to review and reviewed it in a day and accepted it. Now, it didn't show any causation. And uh, some people argued that I was not a good reviewer because there's nothing in it that distinguishes it from HTLV2. That is true. But we knew 
that they, from talking to them, that it was a cytopathic virus. And this is nothing like HTLV2. So we knew it was likely to become something important, but it was one patient. It couldn't be grown. No blood test was developed. It couldn't be linked to the disease. The difficulties with, a, with showing age was the cause, was that the clinical latencies can be seven, 10 years, even more. When doctors and, and infectious disease people don't ask what somebody did 10 years ago, they ask what you did yesterday, last week, last month. There were multiple microbial infections. Which one was causative? As it turned out, all the candidates you saw on the previous slide and all the other microbial infections that people with AIDS tend to exhibit, none were the cause. In our work, we were helped a lot by clinical scientists who provided us the necessary cells as well as the patients who are unidentified. But those clinical collaborators often made contributions by discussions with me. They're listed on this slide. I don't forget them. And I think you, you at Gladstone or at UCSF, anybody working in the field will know the names of those people. Mark Kaplan is no longer at Cornell. I could say he's at Michigan now. Now, this is a story that's not published. This is a story that is unknown, except that when I first present, I presented this for the first time at a seminar at Johns Hopkins and the editor of the Journal of Pathology was in the audience and he asked me if he could publish it. I said, yeah, I, yes, it's never been published. So he put it on the cover of the journal. And it, this slide has a lot to it. And you know, maybe someday it needs to be written up. You can look at this, the, the electron micrograph and you can see HIV now that we know what HIV looks like. And we, you can see HTLV1. Now retroviruses are supposed to interfere. They're not supposed to infect the same cell. You're seeing proof that they do. Okay, now think of what we were thinking of. We were suggesting that the cause of AIDS was a new human retrovirus. We were right. And it was the only productive idea that worked for finding the cause of AIDS. But we also thought it would be one of the HTLVs, probably an envelope for mutation like we sometimes saw with feline leukemia virus causing some things other than leukemia. But that was not true, but we thought it was true. This is a sample that came from a young man on his honeymoon in Haiti. Like many people in Haiti, he got into car accidents and he needed blood transfusions. He was transfused with blood, I think uh, several, uh, several pints, and he got sick. And Jacques, the late Jacques Leibovitch, brought samples to my lab in the end of 82, six samples. This is one of them. And it caused a tremendous setback for us. It caused confusion. And, but later it gave us a big advantage. And I'll tell you why with the one slide. The confusion was that our antibodies, monoclonals coming from Marjorie Guroff, cross react with those cells. So, ah. But it's not HTLV1, there are many differences and it's cytopathic. And therefore, even this electron micrograph, we think it's one virus, one virus undergoing different stages of maturation. And so we looked for that with our antibodies to HTLV1 in particular tractions that were reverse transcriptase positive. However, it was not regular to find particular reverse transcriptase because HIV infected people with people with, a, with frank AIDS, which they had at the time because we couldn't identify them earlier because there was no test then, had hardly any T cells in blood, which meant that we would get false negatives quite commonly. So out of 20 samples, you might get five that are positive, maybe eight if you were lucky or 10 if you were really doing well, but we get a lot of negatives. What the hell was going on here? And then in addition to that, why, are, why weren't they reacting with Marjorie's antibody? Well, Marjorie did a lot more studies and one day came to see me in spring of 83 and said, you know, there really isn't an HTLV cross reaction. The bulk are negative. It's only about four, max 5% we're seeing positive. And I think they are HTLV itself. Well, it turned out to be mostly were HTLV2 and they were drug addicts. HTLV2 goes a lot in drug addicts. When the dawn occurred, and we were able, I should say Mika, was able to pull out do the two viruses from this cell source. That was the negative. That really, um, you know, like we were almost like we had blindfolders on. 
However, we there we had HTLV1 immortalizing those cells. So we knew HIV could grow in CD4 immortalized T cells, at least some clones. And that would provide a great advantage for us in a little while. So getting back to the flow of this, the frequent detection or isolation of virus in 83 and 84, we had a total of 48 different isolates, 48 different patients when we published. This was one of the four science papers. By January of 85, we had 105 isolates, which we reported in PNAS. There were additional isolates coming from the Paris group. We were still worried that it was insufficient to conclude that HIV was the cause of AIDS because verification is necessary for science to progress. We were worried that others would not do this, the isolation. So before we published those papers, we needed something more. Verification of virus isolation is going to be difficult by other labs because tissue specimens were limited. They weren't even allowed in some institutions. T cell culture technology was not widely available in virology labs at the time. The IL-2 problem, they didn't use IL-2. They probably didn't even know about it. AIDS had to be clinically recognized. And by that time, the patients generally had very few T cells in their blood, as I've said already, making virus isolation extremely tricky. The consequence was that few groups were involved, but in the fall of 83, we had a key advance. The capacity for continuous cell line culture, not of one that has been made out by one, well, in a difficult time for me, as if we had one isolate, but we had six in permanent culture. It made several things possible. The blood test, drug screening, detailed molecular analysis of HIV genes and proteins and so on. My key colleagues in this work were Mika Popovic and my technicians, Betsy Reed Canole and Ursel Richardson. The blood test was able to verify etiology for us. That was, of course it was important for other reasons or useful for other reasons, but the blood test was safe and simple and sensitive and accurate and inexpensive and rapid. We adapted the Western blot to clinical medicine for the first time at that time. We, we started with ELISA with the follow-up of, of the Western blot. When we had the advantage of mass-produced virus so, and continuous culture of virus, so we didn't have to use different cells from different people with different HLAs, et cetera. Thus verification, we sent out the material and verification became instant, enabling surveys of thousands of sera globally and removed any doubts that we would have to publish. That happened by the end of 1983, the beginning of 1984. We felt good. We exchanged uh, blinded samples with Jim Curran at CDC and all was well. The blood test was a key advance because of the blood supply, preventing blood transfusion infections, especially for the uh, hemophiliacs, which were being so highly infected. It allowed the epidemic to be followed for the first time. The culture system allowed the first searching for anti-HIV drugs. When therapy became available, we can determine who to treat as well as what mothers to treat to block child transmission. And clinically, it verified HIV as the cause of AIDS. I now turn to some other key early advances that occurred after this, these publications. The tropism of HIV beyond activated CD4 cells include macrophages and microglial cells of the brain. We were able to show in the earliest studies the latency. This is not a recent finding about for therapy that was known from the start of the field. And we knew that expression occurred only after activation of the T cells. The HIV genome was sequenced, the protein functions begin to be analyzed, the regulatory genes and mechanisms involved, some restriction factors found, the molecular mechanisms of latency beginning, and the SIV monkey model for infection and pathogenesis coming from DeRosier and colleagues in Boston. But many of these molecular biology advances involved heavily Warner Green and in part Eric Verdon in some of the crit most critical studies. And uh, they should get substantial credit. Discovery of the beta chemokines as blocking HIV was mentioned by, by Warner. But I have to tell you, it was instigated in our minds by Jay Levy's discovery of some extracellular CD8 factors inhibiting HIV and we, we didn't get involved early on it. There were a lot of people saying they were having, finding it, they were gonna get it. I don't wanna get say who or when, but you know, after a while it became, you know, we, be, we, we thought we better get into it because uh, this seemed important. And this was the discovery that the beta chemokines, Rantes, MIP1 alpha, MIP1 beta, potently block HIV infection. And they were produced 
by both CD4 and CD8 cells. This is why I never, uh, that's the part of Jay's story that I didn't understand because CD4 T cells can be a rich source. And when you clone them and you get into single cell populations and grow them up, they can be a very rich source and even the best source of these inhibitory factors. Um, let me move on. Discovery of the HIV receptors, which Warner already mentioned, the CD4 was somewhat obvious because all the cells that were being infected had CD4 on their surface and there were antibodies available so you could use those antibodies and block infection. Klatzman was probably the first paper uh, in the Paris group. The co-receptors CCR5 and CXCR4, this is also, also mentioned already by, by Warner. Uh, Ed Berger played a major role in this and several other groups in the CXCR4 especially came into it as well. See, and CCR5 also became important, as you know, from the, um, the, 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 when you have two alleles, you're essentially protected almost completely against infection, most people. So that, that turned out to be a pretty, pretty great consequence. So now we want to go into therapy. Um, about the beginning of therapy, it was thought to be more or less impossible to target viruses because they lack metabolism, of course. But the genomes do encode proteins for replication and structural proteins and um, usually have some mechanism for inhibiting immune attacks. In fact, they invariably do. So understanding HIV replication cycle was critical. And I don't, I won't go into the mouse studies, but we had, we, well, never mind. It's not important for this, this talk. Anti-HIV therapy early. In vitro, Sam Broder wanted to come to our lab. He did. Uh, he was working right where my colleague Marvin Wrights worked. And he wanted to try to develop drugs in collaboration with Girls Welcome, which we had just visited. And he tested them. And we, we were able to show with him in that beginning that there was greater effect on, on uh, reverse transcriptase than there was on the human DNA polymerases alpha, beta, gamma, that they inhibited HIV infection in cell culture as well. This paper was published with the uh, Burroughs Welcome Group. And then in vivo, Broder and Bob Yarshorn at NCI, collaborating with Burroughs Welcome, showed its efficacy. That is to say, they demonstrated that CD4 increased while HIV was decreasing. For me, this is historical. It's the first time in any antiviral drug showed clinical efficacy, as far as I know, in a systemic virus disease. And it brought the pharmaceutical companies marching into the field. They were there to some extent, but not like until this came out did they really come in. So then we come to maturity. Several pharmaceutical companies developed antivirus drugs targeting reverse transcriptase again. So there were several reverse transcriptase inhibitors and they could be combined. Different targets like viral protease entry inhibitors, later the integrase inhibitors and combination therapy became obvious. Time was needed to find the best and least toxic combinations. Ultimately, we have the dramatic results of strong long-term viral suppression achieved, allowing a reasonable lifespan for patients, I mean a reasonable life for patients. Many companies, notably Gilead with the late John Martin Merck, with Emilio Amini, Dario Hazuda, and David Berry and his colleagues at Burroughs Welcome uh, deserve credit, as well as the clinicians like Ho and others that brought it into clinical trials. Okay, now what about the present and future as we come to the closing part of this? I'm going faster because I'm looking at time, though I know we started a little late, but I don't know if you have a chance to, to let me go two minutes longer. There is a focus on cure now, but you all know that we have to define what we mean by that because a virological cure is likely unachievable and it's not gonna be provable. And I don't think it's ever been proved, ever. Most you now use the word cure to mean no more therapy is ever needed. And I believe that is likely going to be doable. The approach is showing some overlap. The one I'm not so favored to, shock and kill, Shock may not reach all sites, and it's usually not so efficient. It's subject also to some toxicity, possibly, from activating other genes and viruses, as well as the compounds themselves. Maybe we can get I, around that. I don't know for sure. Idea for the kill of the virus expressing cells was originally from the cyto, it was thought to be the cytotoxic effects of expressed virus. But we know from the earliest HIV research, not all cells die. Then the idea emerges is that the kill will come from CTLs, but there's a limited number of CTLs and HIV variants are going to defeat this in my mind. If the approach did work, anti-HIV drugs are then gonna be used to prevent any virus release from infecting new cells. So my honest view of this is that it was a good try. It's overstressed and maybe a bit overfunded today. Whereas I like this idea, the block and lock, 
kind of opposite of shock and kill, seeking a continuation of strong, long-lasting HIV latency. If you don't express the virus, it's going to be far less toxic, obviously. It doesn't mean you won't have some proteins made that could be a problem or that just the integrated genes might turn on or turn off nearby genes that could be a problem. But nonetheless, the greatest problems of HIV would likely disappear if you could hold it in latency. So there's a lot of studies going on for the molecular understanding of how to fix latency. But the most interesting plan then comes, could we actually get rid of it if we had it there and we could work on it? Removal of those sequences now has a chance by the new technology of CRISPR caspase 9. This is exemplified by your uh, becoming well, very well known HOPE co-laboratory led by Melanie, Melanie Ott with Warner Green, Nadia Rowan, outside collaborators like Eric Burden et al. There's also independent work at some other places. I know University of Nebraska, Howard Gentleman, uh, following a similar strategy, his work and the related work at Glassstone UCSF bears close watch and substantial funding. A better understanding and exploitation of pathogenesis is more akin to my own interest and capacity. Like SARS coronavirus 2, interferon alpha is a positive factor in acute infection with HIV, but detrimental in the hyperactivated chronic phase, killing normal CD4 T cells. As Daniel Zaguri, my colleague and collaborator in Paris for many, many years, decades, I should say, and I reported for the first time 30, about 30 years ago. It's made worse by extracellular TAC. We had shown in our Kaposi sarcoma studies that TAC can be released by acutely infected cells. And release TAC can increase macrophage interferon alpha overproduction. Therapy of AIDS, nonetheless, with interferon alpha had gone forward. Predictably, it gave bad results. That's dangerous. In a very recent collaboration with Daniel Zaguri, and I should have mentioned that his coworker, Helene Lebwanik in Paris, this is not published, uh, like, and we're just writing it now. So very, it's not preliminary. I think it's firm, but we haven't published it yet. We showed that a key factor to the elite controllers is their capacity to control overproduction of interferon alpha. Interferon alpha is indeed overproduced in HIV infected people and is a danger, just like chronic stages after the very earliest days of SARS coronavirus 2 infection, probably all virus infections. We propose targeting interferon alpha in the chronic phase. We propose augmenting interferon lambda, lambda, which is equally antiviral in the early stage, and but doesn't kill the uninfected CD4 T cells critical in any adaptive immune response, like alpha does. Interferon alpha does do that. It's one of its major functions. CD4 T cells lack interferon lambda receptors. So Lambda is free of that, that uh, bad effect. We also suggest enhancing CD8 suppressive T cells, which only kill by inducing apoptosis the infected CD4 T cells. But this is a much longer story and we're writing two papers on it right now and which I hope will get straightforward published. So future pathogenesis ideas continue in the elite controllers I've already referred to. We need to, I think the idea is very good if, focusing on how they control HIV without therapy for many years. What is special about them? Or is there nothing genetically special about them, such as simply being infected by a lower dose, thereby avoiding early permanent immune structural fibrotic damage? I think both are true. I think there is something special about them. The HLA B57 frequency, not 100%, but it's there so often that it must be something significant genetically. But I also think there's something, we, let's call it circumstantial. I believe it's likely that they became infected with lower dose. Just those that were infected with lower dose and many of that have B, B, HLA B57. But no matter, no matter, it really doesn't matter. Finding precisely what differs functionally in them may be rewarding for therapy and even preventive vaccines. Needless to say, I'm not the first person to say this. There have been many clinical contributions. I think it's been led by Bruce Walker, the Deeks, Steve Deeks and Walker 2007 paper championed this field and certainly got me interested. Prevention, a vaccine against HIV, and I'm coming to the end of the talk now, can't be entirely based on principles from classical virus vaccinology because as a retrovirus, it integrates its genome within 24 hours, leaving little time for immune recall while error-prone polymerase helps rapidly produce variants. 
the consequences are we likely need sterilizing immunity and the protective immune response needs to last. This is not required for prior successful vaccines. The studies of vaccines are depressing. There's a continual failure, as you all know, of numerous trials, including two that are just coming out most based on broadly neutralizing antibodies and or adenovirus 5 or adenovirus 26 delivered viral genes. There's a policy of heavy funding of two consortia. They're almost all based on broadly neutralizing antibodies. Though this is reasonable, it's only, there's only suggestive, if any, significant evidence in primate trials at all, and no evidence in human trials. So for for broadly neutralizing antibodies is, there, is the simplicity, the logic, and the results from passive immunization in primates and recent in humans, in the humans using these monoclonal repeatedly injected antibodies. But both studies have serious limitations for application to active vaccination. What are those limitations? Well, for the monoclonal antibodies in humans, they were injected every eight weeks over 20 months for some protection, some protection, most failed limitations. And in the success, we have the same problem as we have with mon monkeys moving to active vaccination. You don't get the titers needed. Research is going on forever to get those titers. I don't think it's going to be obtained. Variants emerge that, um, that resist. The antibodies don't survive very long, something that's usually not mentioned or paid attention to. There's an environment in, active, an, in an active vaccination that is not controlled in passive immunization. That is, there's many more activated CD4 T cells and possibly, as of a few days ago, enhancing antibody effects demonstrated by Ruth Ruprecht uh, are also present and can have different and opposing effects on different strains and variants of HIV. And in monkeys, the monoclonal and neutralizing antibodies are usually given before, during, or early after challenge. You don't have that luxury with active immunization. At the bottom, I made a point that maybe the long lasting potent drugs will do better. The status of our own vaccine, and you may recall, uh, we were working on that. I would like to get towards the end of this with that. The best results in the monkey models come from Derosier early on and more recently with most of the virus genome expressing replicating defective particles and by Lou Picker with an unconventional approach neither correlate with broad neutralizing antibodies with protection. Of the many clinical trials, only one was slightly affected, the army TIE trial, RB114. But they, met, they don't have funding to repeat this trial. It went out of business. They repeated it to an extent, but it was modified substantially, so there is no direct comparison to repeat it. There's no correlation with neutralizing antibodies, only with FC-mediated antibody functions, a bit, not overly impressive, and with targeting V2 regions of the envelope. In our studies, we showed that antibody to envelope are, in my mind, rather definitively short-lived. This will be a problem, even if we have the right antibody-based vaccine. This looks at the RV114 trial. Take a look at the top. The blue and the red are the decline in the antibody. I saw this slide at a press conference. There was just a few scientists present, just maybe two or three. And I was asked to come to it, and I left early. This slide was enough. Look at the protection in black. If you look at the first few months, that's a licensed vaccine. 62, 64% are protected. But then massive drop, just as we see in monkeys with any envelope-based vaccine. We think we know the whys of this. And by we, I now have to mention my colleague, George Lewis and Tony DeVico, We've worked together about it. And George particularly has been a hawk about this short lasting antibodies. But if they have this glycosylation pattern, whether it be coronaviruses, whether it be the, including the current one, which we were able to say wouldn't last long when we saw the genome after the Chinese publication in early January of 2020. It's also true for flu. It's also true for Ebola. It's true for a number of viruses. They have these glycosylation patterns and coverage, uh, mano side chains, et cetera. This is what happens. Um, we had been funded to try to answer this. There's data that what's going on, um, that particularly in Tony DeVico's studies which, and George's studies are demonstrating 
that these the B cells that respond to this kind of antigen are destined not to mature properly and not to end up in, in the right bone marrow niches as plasmablasts that will ultimately be making the those antibodies that go out to the gamma phase of antibody production and last a long time. Look below and you see in green what HPV does. Yeah, it lasts forever. Like more or less, so they can go out, I think it'll be for a lifetime, just like measles, mumps, rubella, like smallpox, like polio, and so on. This is not going to happen with HIV. So one lesson is don't put all the eggs in one basket, I think. But if you do, don't ignore the holes in the basket or the ones in the road. So this is the new approach that we tried. This is a modified version of someone else's uh, cartoon. And looking left to right, I just want to show you that we focused on this big structural change that occurs when GP120 binds CD4. So the oval changes to the bean, and we use the bean as the vaccine. It bound to D1, D2, as Tony DeVico first devised. But there's a linker sequence between the both, and you see that linker sequence here of 20 neutral amino acids of serine and glycine. Now, why do we want that? When you bind CD4 to GP120, and when this genome is expressed, when this, this is expressed, there's a, the conformational change occurs and it opens new sites. Those new sites expose epitopes that are for ADCC um, and predominantly that we have been seeing had some correlation with protection. Those sites are needed. Those sites are functional. Those sites are conserved. So it gave us some optimism. Here's the results idealized in two slides, one slide, two panels. So in the left, you see non-sterilizing protection. That was disappointing, but the vaccine did lower the amount of virus. On the right, we got sterilizing protection. We're very excited. But in time, it's all lost. So if we went further, the red would go up to join the yellow. The vaccine group would become like the control group. In four months, five months, it's over. As we're learning, not quite as much, but we're learning similarity to SARS coronavirus 2 vaccines. That's why we need these boosts and we'll continue to need them maybe even more frequently. So I think we're going to be too long if I go through this, but this is a very big argument my colleague George would make that if we learn everything about how to recognize what's going on in a simple assay, um, we won't have to wait years to show that a vaccine is not going to work because it won't be durable, which now you need to follow not for five months but for a few years to determine that. So this is a, some what it, he's hoping for. So attempting to solve the problem, first of all, by boosting, boosting, boosting is not so feasible. And by using adjuvants, vectors, maybe more proteins can, loss, can cause a loss of efficacy completely. How do, why? Because at the rectal mucosal sites, you, or the, oh, mucosal sites, I shouldn't say rectal, you'll get far more activated CD4 T cells, which makes infection easier. So you may have a vaccine and you won't even know it because you have more sites for HIV and you just can't keep up with it. Uh, ooh, yeah. This slide shows that in our correlates, in our monkey data, it correlated with the log of ADCC on the ordinate. And if you look on the abscissa, interferon LD spots, it doesn't correlate with the greater the LD spots, the greater the vaccine. There was a so-called sweet spot uh, that you see, but if you went up to a thousand LE spots, you lose it. You lose the effect of the vaccine because there's too many activated CD4 T cells. We published the data on this in PNAS back in 2015, I guess, and the a perspective on it a little bit earlier uh, between uh, my colleagues, myself, George Lewis, and Tony DeVico. So believe us, they, uh, there is a problem with antibody longevity not just for the new pandemic, but if you care about an HIV vaccine for an HIV vaccine by antibody going this direction. My conclusion on vaccines is I, I should tell you, we're going forward with a clinical trial with the army in Thailand, but I'm not greatly optimistic about true success. So I, I wanna be upfront about it. I, if we get some effect, I will learn something. We go, we likely make another move with it, but I don't think we can conquer the problem with this approach. I began many years ago, pushing humoral immunity and very much against vaccines based on cellular responses. I think I was wrong. I have changed. Cellular immune response may be the right path, but you have to be cautious with activated CD4 T cells. 
I think we need new insights, more creative thinking with major increase in individual initiated grants and less of all investigators being in the same huddle. We can say one thing for sure, in these 37 years, this is a tough problem. Maybe the drugs will save the day. So was Albert correct? You can read what I see. The successful vaccine against HIV is not going to happen. Albert Sabin before he died. Thank you again for inviting me for your attention and my very best wishes to Gladstone for your continued and additional success. Well, thank you, Bob. That was, that was quite a thrilling journey. Um, I, I, as the moderator, I would like to, to ask a, a two-part question. One is uh, uh, backward-facing and one is forward-facing. So you have a do-over, 40 years of your involvement in HIV research. What one thing would you do different? I wouldn't have spent so much time working uh, and thinking about humoral vaccines and saying the guys working on cellular like uh, Bruce Walker and others were, 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 Andrew McMichael were going down the wrong pathway. That it was, well, you know, that's the last thing on my mind, you know, and maybe the last thing on my mind is the first thing I can remember these days, you know, so maybe that's not, maybe you have to give me overnight to think about that and I'll come back to you, but what else would I do differently? Um, there were things out of my control that I wish, wish were different, Warner, as you can imagine. Um, well, let, me, right, let me ask the forward-looking uh, corollary, and that is, so there are a number of, of people on the, listening to your seminar today who are young. Oh, wait, Warner, I know what I would have done. I would, if I could do things differently, I would have worked harder on that original sample from Leibovitch and saved six months of wasted time. Okay. And okay. Then it, would, it would have been a much different story that I would be telling. <laughs> okay. And the, so the forward-looking question is, many young investigators involved in HIV research are on, uh, listening to you talk today. What would be your advice to them about their future um, and what they should focus on? I think it may be essential to, um, if you're really hooked only to HIV, it's a harder question, or I would slightly diversify the portfolio and have something else going on. Just because, look, when we look for human retroviruses, I had good funding, but I also knew enough to be doing some other things that were acceptable by the scientific community, or I'd have trouble. There may be trouble in the near future for funding from HIV. We don't know. I was thinking it would happen earlier and harder. We don't know. So I think it would be wise to have something else going on or something with HIV that has general impact, not just HIV, maybe fundamental to other disease, viral diseases, maybe fundamental for vaccinology, maybe fundamental to cancer, um, et cetera so that it have ramification beyond just AIDS. But if I were hooked only to AIDS, I would never give up. I would find every possible way I could of funding. And I would, um, well, you know, I, I gave my hand by what I work on. I like thinking about how does this disease occur? And I think it's a very good idea, the people who promoted the elite controllers. And that's another wish. I wish I paid more attention to that earlier. Um, I think, you know, there really are strong hints there and I, I and I'm getting um, enthusiastic about what I, I, I'm collaborating on in that regard. So I would really push hard the pathogenesis. And if I were a betting person, I would want to maybe be around those molecular biologists that know how to use CRISPR caspase 9 and um, what you guys are up to, because that has a chance for a home run with the bases loaded. And I'm intrigued by home runs. <laughs> so it would I, be, uh, I, I, could, I, I, I couldn't resist it, I think, if I were around Gladstone. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, there one, the one last question, and I'll tell you if uh, Steve Deeks asks the following. What is your opinion? At first, he says, was a very provocative presentation. What is your opinion regarding- Provocative is an insult by Steve Deeks, I think. <laughs> what, is the what is your opinion regarding the recent stories of HIV being preferentially integrated in exogenic regions in some controllers? This is similar to the HERV story. Can the study of other human retroviruses help us with new therapies to cure HIV? I, I, no, I, I, I think it's extremely interesting. What can I say? 
Uh, I believe it. It's clearly reported as such, and I think it's an, it is a pathway to find. It may be that, I'll tell you what, I, I think it's an accident of low-grade infection. I think the amount of virus titer was low, and I think that's what happened. And I think if you could imitate it in a humanized mouse model, with, just do a dose curve and see what happens. But I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I, that's one thing I don't understand about um, Steve, uh, I don't know if it's Steve's argument or Bruce's argument or whose argument, but I don't understand why you don't why just say that knowing that mechanism is important, but why is Bruce or you so hooked to at the level of the clusters versus what if they weren't clustered? What if they, I mean, I, do, I would look at the functionality of what's going on. And that's what I'm trying to do. I don't think that's going to get you answers by, unless you can really mimic it with a model. I don't think, uh, and no, I don't think you're going to get it out of studying other human retroviruses or other viruses. I don't think that's going to come. So, and then provocative, Steve, is, is, is really a tough, a tough comment. So uh, I'll wait for your next paper, then you'll get my comment. I think it was clearly couched in a very positive term. Let me, let me. Warner, you know I'm joking. Come on. Let me add my editorial cup. So let, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this uh, uh, World AIDS Day event. Uh, we were so privileged to have Bob Gallo as our speaker, and I hope that you um, really gained, a, I gleaned a lot of insight in terms of that trip through 40 years. Uh, there is a lot to be learned um, um, by, stu by studying what happened in the past so we can guide ourselves uh, more capably into the future. Thank you again, Bob, and thank you for uh, all who attended. Thank you. Thank you, Warren, very much.